Oscar film, following one of two scenarios proposed by the commission, that the fatal shot came from the grassy knoll. X-rays of the president's brain, Dr. Aguilar saw what he calls a snow trail of tiny lead particles that would not come from the type of ammunition Oswald used, a military-style jacketed bullet, a lead core wrapped in copper. When a jacketed bullet hits a skull, it breaks into small fragments, but because of the jacket, the, the lead inside does not disperse into tiny little fragments. When you use a soft-pointed hunting round, it flattens on impact and it breaks up into tiny little fragments, and the fragments don't go very far. A snowstorm of lead doesn't come from, a, can't come from a military jacketed bullet, but comes from an ordinary lead hunting round. So all, all this fits together. A second type of bullet, a hunting round, would mean a second assassin. Remember, several witnesses reported the shot that killed the president sounded different than the others, including that Secret Service agent running to the limousine just feet away at the critical moment. Did those two shots sound different or did they sound the same? They sounded different to me. Thompson next revisited the sound of gunfire captured by that open microphone on a Dallas police motorcycle tuned to Channel One. In 1982, the National Academy of Sciences disputed that recording. They compared it to Channel 2 of the police radio that day and ruled what sounded like gunfire actually happened 60 seconds after the assassination. That particular report has been believed for about 30 years. It was wrong. It was wildly wrong. Together. Now that the motorcycle recording stands as authentic, Josiah Thompson has synchronized it to the Sapruder film and calculated the gunfire came at frames 175, 204, 224, 313, and 328. Oswald's rifle could not reload fast enough to fire all those shots. The fastest time you could fire the right rifle was 2.3 seconds. And that was adopted by the Warren Commission as a minimum mechanical firing time of the rifle. The first three shots occur in just 2.75 seconds. There's a miss. President Kennedy hit in the neck. You see him react as he clears the Stemmons freeway sign. Then Governor Conley is shot. Conley's turning and very suddenly you see the lapel of his coat flip out and he lifts his, his hat up. You see Conley's face contort in pain. Then a break in the gunfire for 4.81 seconds until the limousine reaches the grassy knoll. Kennedy got hit from somebody right over there above the right temple. He was thrown backwards into the left and then three quarters of a second after that, he was hit by a second shot from the depository. Josiah Thompson writes in his new book, Last Second in Dallas, after that fatal shot from the knoll, you can see the president's head suffer even more damage as the final bullet from the book depository pushed him forward. Technically, he was not killed by Oswald. We know that. What we do know is that Lee Harvey Oswald was not behind the, the stockade fence on the knoll. And that particular wound was so grievous. The final piece of the puzzle, two distinct debris fields, divergent trails of blood and bone and brain, proving at least two shooters conspired to kill the president. A harder surface around it. Check the firing speed of the type of rifle used by Lee Harvey Oswald. But his most important contribution may be this, his study of where blood, bone, and brain matter traveled during that last second. The shot came from the front that did what we're talking about, but that within a second, a second bullet also struck. When you put these two datas, data streams together, all of a sudden, a lot of things fall in place. Dr. DeSalles analyzed the Zapruder film and four other home movies taken at that time. 
He plotted the location of everyone in the president's limousine, the Secret Service car following closely behind, and four police motorcycles just off to either side. The first of the final two gunshots came from the grassy knoll and spread blood, bone, and brain matter in the same direction, to the left and rear. Kennedy gets hit, gets thrown to the left rear, all the impact debris goes to the left rear, and then three quarters of a second later, he gets hit again, goes forward, all the impact debris goes forward, covering the limousine. So you had two specific debris fields. Yeah, but they're simple. The same thing happens in both. Kennedy's head, when hit, goes along the trajectory of the bullet, the, the flight line of the bullet. First evidence of that, Secret Service agent Clint Hill jumped from the follow-up car and almost made it to the president's limousine when the fatal shot came from the grassy knoll. It sent debris all over Hill. It was just like an eruption. Blood, brain matter, bone fragments, everything you can imagine, you know, come, up coming out of the head. Then Jacqueline Kennedy climbed on the trunk of the limousine, reaching for pieces of her husband's skull sent backwards by the blast. She at that time had come up on the back of the trunk, trying to recover some of the material that came out of the president's head, and she actually did get a hold of some of it. Next in line, the motorcycle officer riding to the left of the limousine's bumper, Bobby Harges. In addition to blood and brain, a piece of skull struck him with such force that he thought it was a bullet. He gets the major blast of that. He gets hit so hard that he said, I thought I'd been shot. Boom, right, in the chest. Hargis dropped his motorcycle and ran in what he believed to be the direction of the gunfire, the grassy knoll. On the Zapruder film, two pieces of bone appear to fly up and to the left. A sheriff's deputy recovered one piece from the gutter, 10 feet to the left of the limousine's path, and the next day, a college student found this two-inch chunk of the president's skull in the grass to the left of Elm Street. The FBI said it was 25 feet away from where Kennedy's head would have been at the time. The other motorcycle officer on the left of the limousine, Billy Martin, reported the blood hit his windshield, the left side of his helmet, and the left side of his uniform. His right side was clean. So you would expect him to get hit with most of the impact debris here on the right side. No, he had none. I kept wondering, why? Well, dummy, the point is that he's in the rain shadow, as it were, of, of Hargis. Hargis took the main blast and shielded him on his right side. Debris from the president's head also reached the Secret Service car, following close behind. But all this material, blood, brain, bone fragments, came out of the wound and just all over everything that got on the car, the follow-up car. The Secret Service agent who's driving the car behind, which is like five feet you know, behind the bumper, he said I had blood on my left arm and it was all over my windshield. Now to the second debris field. Just three quarters of a second after the shot from the grassy knoll, the final shot from the Texas School Book Depository hit President Kennedy, sending debris forward. We know for a fact there was blood on the front of that limousine. Governor Conley said as he was you know, laying in the seat, when the blow struck, debris blew over the top of them, obviously coming from the rear. The FBI also found blood on the back of the Secret Service agent driving the limousine and the agent in the front passenger seat, blood on the inside of the windshield and as far forward as the hood ornament. Physics determines how particles of blood and brain move. Two bullet fragments landed in the front seat area after apparently cracking the windshield, leaving a lead smear on the glass and a dent in the chrome strip above it. One other crucial argument, why would the motorcycle officers on the left become showered with debris, but not the motorcycle officers on the right? Kennedy's in this position in the limousine, in the right corner. So you would expect if he was hit from the rear, that goes in the rear and blows out the, the right top of his head, Cheney, who is right here, would have received a lot of impact debris. Uh-uh, none, zero, nada. Officers Jim Cheney and Douglas Jackson on the right side were clean. Now, if you're shot from a position almost directly behind you and you're hit on the right side, you're hard pressed to explain why is it the men on the left were struck and the, the two officers on the right were not. I mean, how do you explain that? One final question. 
We know police arrested Lee Harvey Oswald just 80 minutes after the assassination of President Kennedy. How did the grassy Noel gunman get away? Josiah Thompson has a theory. How the final moments of the plot to kill the president played out. On the Knoll, the gunman behind the fence may have noticed the car slowing as he squeezed the trigger. After the barrage of gunfire, Lee Harvey Oswald calmly walked from the Texas School Book Depository, Coca-Cola in hand. And the man who actually fired the fatal shot from behind the stockade fence had his own getaway plan. His car was parked there undoubtedly. Probably had the trunk open, he threw the gun in the trunk, closed it. That would take maybe five seconds. Then he's just a bystander. In other words, there's no reason to arrest him. Dallas traffic officer Joe Marshall Smith thought the shots came from behind the stockade fence. He ran there, said he caught the smell of gunpowder, and confronted a man wearing a sports shirt. When the man flashed Secret Service credentials, Officer Smith let him go, but later said the man had dirty fingernails, like an auto mechanic's hands, and afterwards it didn't ring true for the Secret Service. Later, the Secret Service confirmed they had no agents in the area at the time. Josiah Thompson believes that could have been the assassin, the same blurry figure in that photograph, the one spotted pacing near the stockade fence by the worker in the railroad switching tower, so close to catching the killer. A cordon was established by police around the parking lot here and up to the depository. But as soon as Oswald was picked up in the Texas theater, the cordon was released and everybody could come and take the car away. Trunks were never searched. The trunks weren't searched? No. And they didn't have license plates or no, any no, record of who had parked here? Nobody took license plates. Thompson writes that the Knoll shooter pitched the rifle into the trunk and either climbed in after it or walked away. Either he or his companion closed the lid and walked away from the car, where either might have become the Secret Service agent Officer Smith later encountered, the one with the dirty fingernails. Reporters at the JFK Assassination Center in Dallas. He had a story to tell, a revelation, that would not only lead every TV newscast in Dallas that evening in August of 1990, but would be the attention-grabbing headlines in newspapers the next day. Ricky White made a startling announcement that would pique interest across the country, that his father was involved in the death of President John F. Kennedy. As cameras clicked away, he told his story, that his father, Roscoe Anthony White, was a CIA operative, posing as a Dallas policeman, and was one of three gunmen that fateful day when the president's motorcade passed through Dealey Plaza in Dallas. He explained to reporters how he said he had learned of his father's involvement. That in 1982, he came across his father's diary outlining the assassination plot. I would not share with anybody else besides myself. When I found the diary, it was a shocking, most incredible thing that one individual in this room could ever find. Because this guy never gave the impression of being a bad guy. Ricky said all of his information came out of his father's diary. A diary that he says had disappeared from his home after Midland FBI agents looked at it. What I heard today does provide in some instances uh, plausible sounding answers to some of those questions. And I think it bears uh, further uh, closer look. And though Ricky had researchers backing him up on his story, including those with the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas, there were others who were skeptical. There's too many people like Gary Mack and Dave Perry that are out there destroying the last who are they? the researchers. Because they've made big deals out of, well, Ricky, did you graduate from high school? Even in a big auditorium, stand up and say you're literate. This appearance on Inside Edition was just one of several Ricky would make after coming forward with his story. And here, too, he and wife Tricia were attacked. And you can think what you want, you can call us liars, you can do what you want. We are not lying. Okay, we have to let the American people make up their mind on this. His appearance on Larry King Live would go much more smoothly. What took you five years to give us this diary? It took me a long time to be able to corroborate the story. Ricky would make several other appearances on the talk show circuit. 
But while he was away telling his story, something happened that Ricky didn't count on. One of the researchers, Joe West, a private investigator in Houston, made a startling announcement of his own, that he had a copy of Roscoe White's missing diary. But what West claimed was the diary was actually a military prayer book, which experts say is a fake. And the media was quick to crucify Ricky White and his story. The Texas Monthly came out and trashed me is because of that fake diary. You know, I don't mind telling anybody it's the truth. My mother created it. You know, if, if it was for attention, money, or what, I don't know. But I know this. I wasn't home taking care of business. I wasn't home trying to be here for my family. Ricky says instead of investigating his story further, the media attacked him. And that's why he's kept a low profile ever since. Mm. I was money greedy and all that were, in fact, it's been the truth throughout this whole slate of the story. And the media came after me. 29-year-old unemployed oil equipment salesman from Midland. But in fact, father he did have a job. One blow after another blow after another blow. And then it, it just wasn't worth it. While Ricky White has stayed out of the limelight, researchers and conspiracy experts on the assassination of JFK have brought his father's story back to life. And in the Oliver Stone movie JFK, the alleged gunman behind the grassy knoll was wearing a Dallas police officer's uniform. Since Ricky's revelation in 1990 and the release of the movie JFK, dozens have come into the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas, supporting the conspiracy theory placing Roscoe White as one of the gunmen in Dealey Plaza. And while Roscoe White's involvement has gained momentum, another West Texas connection to the JFK assassination has surfaced, this time in Crane. Researchers are checking out leads that guns stolen from a ranch in Crane County may have been used to assassinate Kennedy. They asked me if I had had some guns stolen out here at any time. And I said, yeah, there were two guns stolen, a 22 and a a 35 Remington that were taken out of the barn. I said, well, what's the connection here? And they said, well, we think these two guns may have been used in the assassination of the president. And I said, you've got to be kidding. It was here at the center in the late spring of 1990 that Ricky White of Midland walked in and told workers his father killed JFK. When Ricky came to the center in the spring of 90, uh, we said, why do you think your father killed John Kennedy? He said, well, I found his, uh, his diary, his journal, and he said he was one of the shooters behind the picket fence. We said, well, let us see the diary. He said, well, I haven't got it. The yeah. FBI took it from it. And we thought, well, we had another coup here, but we haven't come in all the time. Howard says even though Ricky couldn't come up with a diary, he didn't come to the JFK Center empty-handed. And I just showed you the documents where Lee Harvey Oswald and Roscoe Wine left on the same ship together to Japan. He said, my father joined the Dallas Police Department in October 7th, 1963. And he was in the police academy in you know, January of 1964. So he was with the Dallas Police Department during the assassination. On the police academy photograph, when he graduated from the um, police department, uh, he was number one in his class. That's why he's sitting in the middle of the class. But what really caught their attention, Howard says, was that Ricky mentioned his mother, Geneva, had worked for Jack Ruby and showed a photograph of the two together. This photograph surfaced in 1988 in Time magazine. I just happened to pick one at random from a group of photographs no one ever seen. Ricky told how his mother and father had met in Paris, Texas, and that when his father got out of the military, they ended up in Dallas. He said his father went to work for the Dallas Police Department, and his mother was hired by Jack Ruby to work as a rail girl at the Carousel Club. Researcher and former co-director of the JFK Center, Gary Shaw, says all of this adds up to more than a coincidence. But it's significant that Roscoe White uh, was an ex-Marine who served duty with Lee Harvey Oswald, was an expert marksman, came to Dallas shortly before the assassination and acquired a job with the Dallas Police Department, actually seven weeks before the assassination, while his wife went to work for Jack Ruby. And uh, you don't find uh, a much better connection than that. While some researchers look to the events right before the president's assassination, others believe the plot to kill Kennedy started much earlier, when he was first elected president, 
Kennedy entered Washington in 1961, immediately surrounded by a den of enemies. Many CIA agents were upset over the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Kennedy's brother Robert inflamed the mafia over his crime busting as attorney general. And the president's threat to pull out of Vietnam, many say, would have cost the country billions of dollars. While the conspiracy theories point in different directions, some say the gunmen involved with the secret mission trained here, near Van Horn, where we sent Big Two's Mike Gibson in search of clues. Ricky White of Midland says his father, Roscoe, took the family on several supposed hunting trips to Van Horn back in 1963. Okay. White produced this copy of a family postcard from March of that year to at least prove he and his dad were in Van Horn at this time. White believes these trips were really an opportunity for his dad and other sharpshooters to practice for the Dealey Plaza murder. We've arrived on the ranch where we now are searching for a cabin, some sophisticated radio equipment, and a canyon. This is from the United Press from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. I think Rogue Elms of the CIA killed him with a mafia as a junior partner and using Oswald as the patsy. Oswald never fired a shot and it was covered up from the very top. Larry Howard, who's the director of the JFK Assassination Center in Dallas, will be spending the rest of his life looking for evidence to solve the assassination of John Kennedy in November of 1963. Howard, like other researchers, believe more than one gunman was involved. They believe the deadly shot killing the president came from the Grassy Knoll area. Midlander Ricky White says his dad, Roscoe White, who worked for the Dallas Police Department, fired the fatal shot. My father is the famous Grassy Knoll assassin. He is the Dallas police officer that participated behind the Grassy Knoll that fired the two fatal shots into Kennedy. I do not believe that Lee Harvey Oswald fired any shots or killed anybody that day. You truly believe Ricky's story? I believe Ricky White is telling the truth. As the president was rushed to Parkland Hospital and the drama of trying to save Kennedy's life was underway, minutes after the shooting, Dallas police say they have a suspect, Lee Harvey Oswald. But as Big Two's Deanne Holcomb has discovered, researchers say the circumstances surrounding his arrest are questionable. Lee Harvey Oswald fits a description of the man seen on the sixth floor of the school book depository building where Dallas police say was the scene of the crime. There a rifle and shell casings had been found. It's believed Oswald fled the depository and ended up at the Texas theater, although no one really knows why. That's where police arrested him. At this point, some researchers say the facts just don't add up. They say Oswald was wanted for killing Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett at 1 p.m. That's when newspaper reports say the announcement went out over the police radio. But that's 15 minutes before Tippett was gunned down. White says his dad also killed Tippett. They were taking somebody to Love Field, which would have to be Oswald. They were all three in the car at the time, and then, then, then nobody knows what took place inside the car because we weren't there. But a commotion took place. Oswald jumped out and ran. That's the reason why he was seen in the vicinity. My father jumped out of the car to chase Oswald down, ran back in the back of the alley. When he couldn't run him down, he came back to the car. Now, what are you going to do with Officer Tippett at this time? You're going to shoot him. Reverend Jack Shaw, a longtime friend of the White family, says he was told Oswald was set up. In uh, meeting with Geneva about uh, three years ago, um, some things came back to her memory that she shared with me. She said that they were down at uh, Jack Ruby's place, and Roscoe and Jack Ruby were in this room talking, and she was overhearing a conversation of the plan to assassinate President Kennedy. Oswald was Patsy. I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. I'm just a Patsy. As Oswald sat in jail, not yet charged with killing the president, over at Parkland Hospital, a fight would break out over Kennedy's body between Secret Service agents and local authorities. Country mourns Kennedy's death. Oswald is blasted away by Dallas nightclub owner Jack Ruby as Dallas police were taking Oswald to another place for questioning. He's been shot. He's been shot. 
Warren Commission would announce to the world Oswald was the lone gunman in the murder of JFK. It claims only three shots were fired coming from behind the president's motorcade. Many disagree with the lone gunman finding. Dr. Charles Crenshaw was at Parkland Hospital and was one of the doctors trying to save the president. It was obvious to me that something had been done to cover up uh, the wounds that we had seen at Parkland to go along with uh, the position that um, Lee Harvey Oswald had been the lone shooter and they shot him from the school book depository. I ended up up in the uh, uh, school book depository and I walked over to the window next to the one Oswald was supposed to have used and I looked out at the kill zone out there and having been a sniper in Vietnam and um, having several uh, body count of my own, I could see exactly what had happened. It was a headshot from the front. I know, I've made them. Here are a few more facts for you. In 1969, Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry told a news reporter, quote, We don't have any proof that Oswald fired the rifle and never did. Nobody has yet been able to put him in that building with a gun in his hand, end quote. And several witnesses that day in 1963, including Dallas policemen, encountered men with Secret Service identification at Dealey Plaza and the Grassy Knoll area before and after the assassination. Yet, there were no agents specifically assigned that day in the area. Reverend Jack Shaw of Dallas says he first met Roscoe and Geneva White in 1970 in Richardson, one year before Roscoe would be fatally injured in a suspicious fire where he worked. Roscoe was uh, the manager of the, I think, the Emmy Moses store at the time. And they came and visited the church, and then after that, then I visited their home on several occasions. There was a time when when Geneva was, was upset, and Roscoe called me in later to visit with her and talk with her. Shaw said through his counseling sessions with Geneva, he learned that in 1963, Roscoe had arranged for her to work for Jack Ruby at the Carousel Club but that she only worked there for a short time. Roscoe had set that up for her to, to work for Jack Ruby as a part of uh, the whole, his whole plan uh, in the assassination. She was only there, for, according to her, for two weeks, and uh, that's when it all blew up. And, uh, they, and Roscoe got her out of there. Shaw says Geneva confided in him that she had overheard a conversation between her husband and Ruby, plotting to kill the president. And that she heard names mentioned, including Lee Harvey Oswald, Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett, and others. Oswald was a patsy, and um, he was... Um, he was... He was just fulfilling a role. Um, she said she overheard this? She, she, she overheard the, that included Oswald and um, included others, and she overheard uh, what part uh, Roscoe would play, what part Jack Ruby would play, that sort of thing. Uh, Roscoe did not want to uh, tip it in Bob because he, he, couldn't, he couldn't trust him. Uh, according to what Geneva's told me, that later uh, proved itself to be true because that was the uh, that was the, the scene where uh, Roscoe and uh, Officer Tippett uh, had a disagreement about uh, how Oswald was to be handled and uh, that Roscoe uh, shot Tippett. Shaw says Geneva recalled Roscoe saying he didn't want Tippett to be involved, but Ruby did and that Roscoe had known Oswald for some time. I had found a Time magazine and had an article in it about, I had to do the Jack Ruby and stuff. And it was that photograph yeah, right there. I, I called Ricky and I said, this, I'm about this, this Time magazine. I said, and this looks just like your mother standing in this picture. Yeah, that's my mother standing right in front of Jack Ruby at the Carousel Club. In that same magazine, they published a photograph of my father and Lee Harvey Oswald mm -hmm. in the Philippines. Ricky says this only added to his belief that his father was involved in the murder of President Kennedy in 1963. First reading his father's diary in 1984, which outlined the assassination, and then coming across a picture of his mother with Jack Ruby. And then you took both to your mother? Mm -hmm. Right. And she... Confronted her that... that that that's her, that's Jack Ruby, this is this, this is that, and, and then by doing that, confronted her and pushed her over to the edge where she, 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 she she's known all these years. I mean, it's, it's sad. Yeah. 
Shaw says after Ruby discovered that Geneva overheard his conversation with Roscoe, he told Roscoe his wife would have to be taken care of. Uh, Jack said that she had to, you know, that she had to be put to death and Roscoe and, and Jack worked it out where she would be given shock treatments. And uh, so she, according to her story, she was given shock treatments uh, at that time. That was the, that was the deal that was made when uh, she was, she was over, she was overhearing her conversations with Jack Ruby and my father and Jack Ruby saw her at the corner of the door and had realized that she'd been there longer than, than necessary to take care of the problem after the, the Kennedy assassination be done that she would promise to go through electrical shock treatments and she did. And we she have went, documentation from her psychiatrist? She went through four electrical shock treatments within about a two year period. And they were making her do this? To, to relapse her memory, to, to, for what reasons? Because she still had that memory still locked in her mind. It Reverend Shaw says he began to learn even more about Roscoe's identity after Geneva told him about a trip she had taken to New Orleans. She said that a man approached her, claiming he knew about Roscoe's involvement in the assassination. And to tell Roscoe, he had 48 hours to get in touch and respond. Geneva flew directly home to warn her husband and was very upset. That's when Roscoe called Reverend Shaw and asked that he come to their home right away. Geneva said you were called to our home because I had, uh, had requested Roscoe to bring you over and I'd asked Roscoe to tell you everything and uh, he could not bring himself to tell you and the reason he couldn't was for fear of your life. But Shaw says what Roscoe did tell him was enough to spark anyone's curiosity. That Roscoe told of his background as a Marine and as a Dallas police officer. And that wasn't all. As he talked about being a policeman, he talked about, he talked about wearing a wig um, and disguising himself. The way I was picking it up is uh, for undercover purposes, and, and I don't know. I mean, that was the impression that I got. I, I had no idea what he was doing, had done with the police force, but um, he sure he sure let me know that he was doing more than just normal police business. And he showed me some pictures that were very intriguing. Um, and I, I, I don't want to talk about who they were, but I've seen a picture of him with some top government officials, and I could not understand that. Are they still alive today? Um, at least, yes, I say at least one of them is. Shaw says he doesn't know if Roscoe was connected to the CIA, but that he has counseled with many people who are. Yes, I would say there was some, you know, there was some ambiguity about the things he was saying that uh, that did cause questions in my mind. Um, but you have to remember that I was much younger than I am now, and I and and I didn't have the I didn't have the experiences that I have today. You know, I, it was a strange thing uh, at at his funeral. Uh, there, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of people there that I, you know, that I, I couldn't imagine Roscoe uh, being acquainted knowing the people. But your father died in 1971. It, it was in 1971, and it was at Eminem Equipment Company in Dallas, Texas, and. Uh, he had gone across the street for a break, had went over there with another gentleman a decade there. And when they had returned back to the work area, he had reached down to pick up a torch to fire it off. And then somebody had came in and cut the settling hoses where the bottom part of the floor was filling up with settling. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the fire just igniting, starting the fire. There was a gas can placed up underneath the, the bench, which was the secondary fire, which engulfed him. Roscoe was taken to Parkland Hospital's burn unit, where he lived for about 24 hours, and Reverend Jack Shaw was with him when he died. He said uh, that this wasn't an accident. Uh, he had come back from break, either break or lunch, and uh, that he had seen someone uh, leaving uh, the building. And, uh, Seems like he said uh, they were dressed in a suit, 
and had a briefcase. I, I got the impression he knew who it was, uh, but he did not identify that person to me. Shaw says before Roscoe died, he cleared his conscience for taking lives on foreign and American soil, which is documented at the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas. This is Roscoe White's death certificate. He died September 24, 1971. After the fire, which he was burned over 95% of his body with third-degree burns, on his deathbed, he told his pastor, Reverend Jack Shaw, that he had killed many people on foreign and domestic soil for his country. At the time, he thought it was right, but now he knows it was wrong. Will God forgive me? And the man died. Roscoe? To anyone um, publicly, and that's that uh, I was contacted by a person um, stating that the the information I have would, would be very important. There, would, there was uh, money available to, to pay me if I would uh, turn the information over to them, no questions asked. And uh, to that person, uh, I said, um, that kind of sounds like a setup to me. The person who approached me said that the person that, uh, that I was to contact had been with the FBI, but was no longer with them. In 1971, Roscoe Anthony White, a former Marine and at one time a Dallas police officer, died after a suspicious fire in Paris, Texas. It would be years later before his son, Ricky White of Midland, would come across his father's military footlocker. Time would pass before Ricky would really examine the contents of that box, but when he did, his life would change forever. Among his father's possessions, Ricky found a small black diary. In it, he says, were the shocking details of his father's involvement in the assassination of President Kennedy. Ricky says his father used code names to refer to himself and others who positioned themselves in Dealey Plaza that fateful day in 1963. His code name was Mandarin, and the other gentleman's name was, was Lebanon, the guy that was in the book depository, and Saul was located in the records building. Also among his father's possessions, Ricky says, were a bank bag, a key to a safety deposit box, and a receipt for $200,000. He claims his father, Roscoe White, Jack Ruby, and Dallas Police Officer J.D. Tippett all had accounts at this bank. When Ricky and his mother Geneva checked on getting into the safety deposit box, bank officials told them they would have to probate his father's will, giving them power of attorney. But Ricky said that would have cost a lot of money, money he didn't have. And that's when Ricky says he asked Midland DA Al Shorey for help. Just, it led on Al wanting more information, more information, and more. Him and Jody Lucky came to the house three or four times and sat on the couch and went through everything and looked at everything and read everything. Time, I mean, I know three times. Like, I know they came over three times and went through the same stuff. Everything, Ricky says, except his father's diary. Um, did uh, J.D. Lucky or Al Shorey touch that diary? see it, open it up, look at it, no. anything mm. in your house. No. Why was that? No. I kept it at a distance. I always did. I never did hand it to anybody or give it to them. The people that ever did ever see it or did read it did it without my permission. One of those people Ricky is referring to was employed as a babysitter. She agreed to an interview, but only if her identity was kept secret. Did you see the diary? Have you ever seen the diary? Yes, I have seen the diary, but at the time I did not know it was a book that I was not supposed to be looking at. I remember seeing names and I couldn't tell his names. I remember seeing numbers. Ricky says two Midland FBI agents also looked through the diary without his permission after they came out to his house demanding he bring any assassination-related material he might have to the Midland Federal Building. It was Butler that introduced himself first to me. And then Ron Butler? Ron Butler. And Ferris was standing beside him. And, and I tried to book him a little bit, and, and uh, I kind of pissed Butler off. And before I know it, he's pulling out a federal book, said, young man, not only do I want you to read it, I want you to read it out loud where I understand that you understand what I'm saying. You know, intimidate I, me. I've spoken to Ron Butler. He told me on the phone that he didn't, was never at your house, has no idea where you live, never been there. That's a downright lie. That's a lie. The babysitter confirms Ricky's version of the events that day. Why can't we reveal your identity? Because I'm calling the FBI liars. And they know it and I know it and I know what happened that particular day. And so we're just afraid for us. 
work for me and my family. The babysitter and Ricky remember loading all of his father's material, including the diary, into a box. And the two FBI agents followed him to the federal building. Ricky says he and the two agents were the only ones in the room, but that a man on a speakerphone asked a lot of questions. He said the two agents referred to the man as Arlen Specter. He is the Pennsylvania senator who had served on the Warren Commission. It was the Warren Commission that determined that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone gunman in the Kennedy assassination. They keep going over and pounding me about how my father's a thief. He stole these photographs. He, he made this story up. He, Ron Butler says, well, we better get, we better get photo stack of copies of it. So he goes over to a Xerox machine and there's Xerox and everything that was in that box. So they had a Xerox copy of the diary, Yes. every page in Yes. It. Ricky says he then loaded the diary and everything back into the box and drove home. Ricky's wife, Tricia, says Ricky was extremely upset when he got home and that he put the box containing the diary on their pool table and headed for the bedroom, vowing he was through trying to prove his story because no one would believe him. Here I thought that the FBI was... Um, people that you would look up and moderate as being Trust. trustful people. And here they let me down. Minutes later, the doorbell rang. And he said, hi, uh, I was in the office with Ricky while I with the FBI and I left my notepad in the box of stuff he brought home. And I said, and I guess you need to get it. And he said, yeah. And I told him, I said, we'll just follow through there and it's back on the pool table. So I went back there and by the time we got to where the door was, Ricky said, who is it? And I turned and went to the doorway. I didn't go in the bedroom, I just went to the doorway. And I said, it's somebody with the FBI. They said they left their notepad in the box. And as soon as I turned around, he was facing me. He said, thank you very much. I got what I needed and walked out. And I, I contacted the head of the Midland FBI, Tom Kersville. Kersville was more than cooperative in giving me an official statement on the matter. And while he was not stationed in Midland when all of this happened, he said, quote, we did interview Ricky White. He did bring documents to us. The FBI did not take them from his possession. The documents and interview were of no value. We never saw a diary, and one has never been in our possession. And the denials of the FBI that they did not see or did not take the diary, uh, from my experience with, uh, with that agency, just don't wash. If Ricky White's story is worthless, then why in January of 1988 did the FBI send a special agent to accompany Midland DA investigator J.D. Lucky around Dallas? in his search for the truth. Lucky had gone there to look for a safety deposit box in which Ricky White believed his father had stashed $200,000. Did the FBI accompany, on, accompany you on this trip? They did. Did you go and uh, oversee or look at these areas? The night, the yeah, the night before and that next morning, uh, we went to these banks and saved his loan to see if, those, if that key and uh, would work in those uh, safety deposit boxes. It did not. Um, you were aware of a secret document on the city of Dallas Police Department. Investigator Lucky said the FBI had met with Ricky Blank, had seen the pictures and diary. Is that correct? I never said that. Uh, I, the FBI, to my knowledge, never saw the diary. We never saw the diary. How do you think they could... Uh, make such a mistake on this. I mean, I mean, is that easy for... Well, like they would want to the only thing I'd say is that he may have misunderstood me. When our attorney first contacted uh, one of the agents in Midland, he said he almost threw up on the table. And I think that's the approach they've taken about this entire story because it's very disturbing to them that, uh, that this is all coming out. I've made a startling announcement that his father, Roscoe Anthony White, a former Marine and Dallas police officer, took part in the Kennedy assassination. As Deanne Holcomb reports, Ricky's news came after he made a chilling discovery in Paris, Texas. In July of 1990, Ricky White says he discovered something he believes his father had hidden away in the event of his death. In fact, what he would find inside his grandfather's burned-out attic was so unsettling, Ricky says he couldn't tell anyone, not even researchers at the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas. In the metal container, uh, well, I told you the items that were in there. Now, Ricky kept this book here and wouldn't give it to us. 
We couldn't understand why he wouldn't give it to us. But if the orders are in there to kill John Kennedy, what can be worse than killing John Kennedy? Inside the canister and wrapped in plastic, Ricky found three decoded cables with orders to kill John Kennedy. Pictures of Ruby shooting Oswald, Roscoe White's dog tags, and this mysterious green book. These are copies of the cables found in the plastic. It says remarks, Mandarin. Now, when Ricky first came to us, he said the diary said his father's full name was Mandarin. Well, lo and behold, it's Mandarin on the cable. It said foreign affairs assignments have been canceled. The next assignment is to eliminate a national security threat to worldwide peace. Destination will be Houston, Austin, or Dallas. Contacts are being arranged now. Orders are subject to change at any time. Reply back if not understood. C. Bowers, OSHA. At the bottom it says RE-Rifle, code AAA, destroy. The second cable says same information at the top. It says remark Mandarin code A, Dallas destination chosen. Your place hidden within the department. Contacts are within this letter. Continue on as planned. The third cable dated December 1963. It says stay within the department. The witnesses have eyes, ears, and mouths. The next word we can't decipher. Do of the mix-up. The men will be in to cover all misleading evidence soon. Stay as planned. Wait for further orders. And though the cables would be considered possible evidence in the death of our president, the worst was yet to come. What Ricky couldn't bring himself to talk about with anyone could be found inside the Green Book. Researchers call it the Witness Elimination Book, where Roscoe White had listed those he had murdered. This is two pages out of the Green Book. It's a uh, shorthand book turned upside down, starting the back, and then newspaper clippings glued onto each page. The picture on the left is of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. If you notice, John Kennedy has a slash across his head. That means he's dead. Oswald's dead, and undoubtedly the girl on the right is dead also. But Robert Kennedy's not. The significance of this, at the very bottom, it says, Godhead going after tail later, which means probably Robert Kennedy. And sure enough, he was assassinated later. Now, that phrase was not known until 1980. That's what Carlos Marcello said to one of his uh, mob figures. We got the head now, we're going to have the tail later. In the back of the book, it says 28 people died under witness program, and then a series of numbers, which we don't know what they mean, and it's signed Roscoe Anthony White and his signature. But tell Howard about the green... No, Howard says they met with Stone, and he offered to buy the rights to the Roscoe White story. They never mentioned the book that Ricky had taken with them. And as far as accepting Stone's offer, Howard said they turned him down. I said two reasons. One, the story's not fully investigated yet. It's got some flaws. And two, we're scared to death. If these cables we have are legitimate, there's only four of us in the world that know where they are and who has them, and we feel our, li our lives are in danger. How would later work for Stone as the conspiracy consultant on the movie set of his controversial blockbuster, JFK. It was before they left the Los Angeles airport that Ricky gave Howard the Green Book. And as their plane approached the Dallas airport, something would go terribly wrong. The plane was coming down, almost touching the runway, and it gave full power and took off again, which is very unusual. It was a 767. It circled the airport two or three times and landed at a remote runway that we didn't even know existed. Howard says the flight attendants told them to evacuate the plane down the chutes immediately. So, you know, we're thinking, oh boy, what, you know, what is this? And I'd taken the green book because Ricky had given me the green book at the L.A. airport, and I'd looked at it and put it in my briefcase. It was in the overhead rack. So while the people were trying to get out of the plane, I was going the wrong direction because I was going to get the green book out because the diary is already missing. So I got it out and stuck it in my pants. Fortunately, Howard said, lucky. We were standing there. That car drives up FBI. They're circling the plane. The men that got out, the plane is sitting there with nobody there, nobody there around it, and these special government cars drive up. So we get at the airport, we finally get back to the center, and I call a friend of mine that works at Delta. I said, what happened on this flight? He said a bomb threat was called into the uh, LA airport when y'all took off. And in the newspaper article, it says the FBI searched the plane. I haven't seen many pictures of Lee Harvey Oswald, the man tagged the assassinator of President John Kennedy. That's why tonight's segment is so important. 
you're going to hear from researchers who believe the photograph of Oswald given to the news media after Kennedy's murder in 1963 is a fake. The picture shows Oswald holding a rifle as he's standing in his backyard. Some researchers now say that famous photo is actually Midlander Ricky White's dad, Roscoe White. As we continue our special exclusive series of reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection, look and listen closely. The man you're about to see may not be the man lawmen say killed JFK. Today, Jack White has returned to the home where Lee Harvey Oswald lived in Dallas before he became known as the assassin of President John Kennedy. White is trying to recreate this famous photograph of Oswald holding a rifle. In 1963, this picture was flashed on television sets across the country as Oswald was branded JFK's killer. You people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. During his interrogation by Dallas police, Oswald told them the photo was fake. These incriminating photos of Oswald's were fakes, just as he tried to tell the Dallas police. He thinks the man posing in the picture is Midlander Ricky White's father, Roscoe White. Notice that the person in the backyard photos has a broad, flat chin, while these pictures of Oswald show him with a pointed cleft chin, not at all like the one in the backyard photos. Now look at the chin of Roscoe White. Whose chin most closely matches the one in the backyard photos? Oswald and Roscoe White were in the Marines together trained at a CIA camp in Japan, and would end up living close to each other in Dallas before Kennedy's assassination in 19... Roscoe White had just been hired on at the Dallas Police Department. These close connections, plus investigative work by Jack White, has convinced JFK researchers the photo could be Roscoe White, not Lee Harvey Oswald. White was about the same height as Oswald. In fact, there were many physical similarities between the two, with the exception of the neck and chin. Roscoe had a thick neck with big sloping shoulders, while Oswald had a thin neck with narrow shoulders. When I enlarged the photos of Oswald and Roscoe to the same size and laid one over the other, I was astounded to find that the height, posture, and even some features are an identical match. Also, it is known that Roscoe suffered a broken right wrist which never healed properly and left a slight lump on his arm. Oswald had no such lump. In this backyard photo, there's a noticeable lump on the figure's right wrist. It certainly seems to me that the figure in the photo could be that of Roscoe White. I believe Roscoe White was placed on the Dallas Police Force to help frame Oswald for the assassination. When Oswald was arrested, two photographs of him with a gun were found. However, suspicion over the photos grew after a burglary in 1975 at Ricky White's mother's house in Paris, Texas. That's when a third Oswald photograph turned up. Ricky says somehow this picture and others made its way into the hands of Washington investigators looking into the Kennedy assassination back in 1976. Ricky thinks this may be one of many reasons why he and his mother Geneva White were questioned about the photo by investigators with the House Select Committee. In the shadow under Oswald's nose is straight down at 12 o'clock, but yet the shadow on the ground is at 10 o'clock. The shadows don't match. And on photograph number two, we have the rifle pointing at about 11 o'clock, but yet the rifle in the shadows pointed at 9 o'clock. It doesn't work. But the significance is that Roscoe White had a third pose of Oswald that no one else had. And it's been proven by experts that these are fake photographs. As part of the fake photo theory, Jack White was called to Washington in 1976, and he too would be questioned by the House Select Committee. This is one of several dozen photographs the Dallas police claimed was found in Oswald's belongings. Apparently it is a photo Oswald took while in the Marines. Uh, there are other photos of Marines and photos of Asian cities. In this photo of Oswald's Marine buddies, I found one person especially intriguing. After comparing the man in the fatigue cap in the center with many photos of Roscoe, I'm convinced they may well be photos of the same man. A. The movie released in 1991 was an instant blockbuster. As a consultant and right-hand man for Stone, Howard provided him with over 400 photographs, 20 videotapes, and several witnesses connected to the Kennedy assassination. One of those, Oswald's widow, Marina. And we've done more for this case with the movie JFK 
than all us researchers in the last 30 years put together. He's the one responsible for having the files open today. As there was a medical conspiracy as well. For nearly 30 years, Dr. Charles Crenshaw kept silent about what he saw at Parkland Hospital, where Kennedy was brought in after being shot in downtown Dallas. The reason he speaks out today, Crenshaw says the autopsy pictures of Kennedy have been altered. As we continue our special series of exclusive reports, JFK, the West Texas Connection, tonight Big Two's Deanne Holcomb takes a look at the medical journey into how Kennedy died. The Bulletin, this is from the United Press, from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. They were riding an open automobile when the shots were fired. The president, his limp body carried in the arms of his wife, Jacqueline, has rushed to Parkland Hospital. All I can say is where is the wound in the back of the head that 27 people saw that's not in the autopsy pictures. Dr. Charles Crenshaw was 30 years old and a resident doctor at Parkland Hospital on the day President John Kennedy was taken there after being gunned down while riding in his motorcade in Dealey Plaza. As a trauma doctor, he would be used to treating gunshot victims, stab wounds, and victims of car accidents. But none of this had prepared him for seeing the President of the United States lying on a gurney, hanging on to life. People in suits were running around. Uh, people were crying. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, problems with the perimeter. The FBI didn't know the Secret Service and vice versa. I got to see the, the entrance wound before he made this incision through it. And then, of course, the tracheostomy tube was put in place. He still was not breathing well. What was going on? Was it just total silence? What, what was happening? There was very little said because it was such a uh, gripping moment. Uh, I think we did our procedures uh, rather quietly, kind of like a team. Everybody was working to get an airway going, uh, to make him breathe correctly and establish circulation. But there wasn't a lot of talking at all. Do you remember what you were thinking at that time? Well, I was thinking that I'd trained all my life to be a surgeon, and here was a traumatic wound to the President of the United States, and I couldn't do anything about it. Surprised that they got the Justice of the Peace, Theron Ward, from Garland to drive into Parkland and to sign the death certificate and to um, uh, release Kennedy's body in the face of being told by Dr. Rose that it was against the law. It was against Texas law, and they were, could not move the body. And the phalanx of guards, I don't know who it was, looked at him and said, we're taking this body out with the Secret Service. This is the President of the United States. And I really believe that um, they, were, they were rolled over on top of Dr. Rose. Tired, depressed, and in shock over the President's death, Crenshaw was even more amazed at news reports that there was a lone assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, responsible for killing Kennedy. The reports also told how the bullets fired from Oswald's gun hit Kennedy from behind. But that's not what Crenshaw saw in Trauma Room 1. The feeling of all of us was that the bullet wound had gone in the throat here, the lower third of the throat, with an entrance wound from the front. And likewise, I felt that the wound in the back of the head was a tangential shot behind, the, above the hairline, here, right in the right rear of the side of his head. You could put your fist in it. While Crenshaw questioned this latest revelation, never in his wildest dreams did he think he would come face to face with Kennedy's believed assassin. But that's what would happen. Crenshaw and other doctors would be ordered to go to the emergency room. As Crenshaw walks in, he sees Lee Harvey Oswald. Here, two days later, Oswald was hanging on to life after being shot by Jack Ruby. He had an operating team ready to go immediately, and his anesthesia was pure oxygen because he was in extreme profound shock. He did, have, he had no pressure, but he did have a pulse. Inside the operating room, Crenshaw is tapped on the shoulder and asked to take a phone call. Picked up the phone, and this voice, like thunder, said, this is the president, Lyndon B. Johnson. How is the accused assassin doing? And I said, well, he's lost a lot of blood, but he is holding his own. He said, there's a man in the room, and I want him to be able to take a deathbed confession. And Oswald wouldn't have been able to talk even if he'd survived. A code of silence took over at Parkland Hospital, 
The reason, Crenshaw says fear of the unknown surrounding Kennedy's death is why many of the doctors, including himself, decided to keep quiet. He says the scope of corruption to cover up seemed so powerful that he, like the others, feared for their medical careers. In 1991, when Crenshaw was at the JFK Assassination Center in Dallas, he saw for the first time the original pre-autopsy pictures of Kennedy, taken at the hospital in Bethesda, Maryland, where the autopsy was performed. Crenshaw was outraged at what he saw, and he promised he would not be silenced anymore. And I believe he'd gotten shot twice from the front, the second one being from the side uh, as a tangent above the hairline, hitting uh, in the, behind the right ear, knocking out the size of a baseball out of the right rear part of the president's head. And for me, to see the back of his head intact, I think that was a, just an incredible experience. Crenshaw kept his promise, and in April of 1992, his book, JFK, Conspiracy of Silence, was published. The first man that came to me used to work in the CIA. He was in on the Bay of Pigs invasion. And in the summer of 1963, he came to Dallas and tried to buy some guns from Roscoe White. They then went together to see General Walker, who was living in Dallas at the time, to try to get some financing for the projects that we're working on. Howard says another man owned a nightclub, and he walked into the center with his wife, telling Howard Jack Ruby was his best friend. He said in, in November, early November of 63, Jack Ruby brought someone into his club, said, I want you to meet a good friend of mine, Roscoe White. Next man was a witness from Dini Plaza. He was across the street from the old man from Bruder was filming, and he fell to the ground when the shots were fired, and then he hammered on by on the ticket fence where he heard the shots come from and the puff of smoke, and he was encountered by a Secret Service man with Secret Service credentials telling him to get away. Uh, the man had a rifle stuck under his coat. He was shown 10 photographs. Of the 10 photographs, he picked one out as being the man that encountered him, and it was Roscoe White. Howard says another witness said she was filming in Dealey Plaza that day and was panning toward the grassy knoll. And her camera was confiscated by the FBI the next day, and the film never been seen. But she saw Roscoe White walking down the steps from the grassy knoll area to Elm Street after the shots were fired, and she recognized him as Geneva's husband, because she, she worked for Jack Ruby herself incredible and he was best friends with J.D. Tippett's son and he said three weeks before the assassination a man came to the Tippett house and they got in an argument with J.D. Tippett and it was Roscoe White he saw his picture in the Texas Monthly Magazine in December of 1990 a woman and her daughter came to sit one night about 10 o'clock said uh, I need to tell you something I said what's that said I was um, working for one of Jack Ruby's attorneys. Matter of fact, I was married to him. And he was one of Jack, Jack, Jack Ruby's first attorney. And before the assassination, and after Jack Ruby killed with Harry Oswald, Roscoe White was at our place every day, before and after the assassination, arranging what we were going to do with Jack Ruby. One other witness, a woman, phoned Howard, but told him she was scared to come to the center. When he met with her, Howard says she told him that her stepfather was one of Roscoe White's best friends and that Roscoe would come to their house to play cards. She said back then her stepfather was the director of one of the major funeral homes in Dallas, and he was also a reconstruction artist on bodies. And at 12.35 on November 22nd, he was called from the funeral home and said he had to go directly to Parkland Hospital. On Friday night, he didn't come home. Saturday, he came on very late and packed the family up and then drove to Austin, Texas, which he called a safe house. And stayed, there's a guy that, was, that ran the safe house, had a big red beard, and had anti-Castro Cuban posters all over the walls. Sunday morning, they got up early, drove to San Antonio, he made the kids play out in the yard and watch TV. When Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald, he went out the yard, said, we can go to Dallas, now it's safe. The woman told Howard that she believed her stepfather altered Kennedy's body and later helped Roscoe White dispose of those who may have known or seen too much. Who does Howard believe was behind the plot to kill Kennedy? I can tell you what I think with the information I have. I think Rogue Ellums of the CIA killed him. 
with a mafia as a junior partner and using Oswald as the patsy. Oswald never fired a shot and it was covered up from the very top by Jager Hoover, Alan Dulles, and London Johnson. And that's how it happened. This is what I know. I think the, the puzzle is, is that here it is almost 30 years after the crime and we still don't know who killed our president and that our government has done everything within its power to keep us from knowing it. They have covered up the evidence, manipulated the evidence, destroyed the evidence, and uh, they continue to do so even to this date. On August the 6th of 1990, the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas, Texas, had a news conference that was worldwide. We had Ricky there to tell his story about his father, Roscoe White. The next day, in the newspapers in Dallas and all over the world, the CIA, the FBI, and the Dallas Police Department said Roscoe White was a nobody. We filed on the Freedom of Information Act to find out if there's nobody had any FBI documents on it. If he was a nobody, he shouldn't have any. But the FBI did have information on Roscoe White, a total of 46 pages. 26 of those were withheld because they were classified. And out of the 20 pages researchers did receive, 19 had been blacked out. The paper made to know the truth. Three years after the murders of President Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald, 18 material witnesses died. Six by gunfire, three in motor accidents, two by suicide, one from a cut throat, one from a karate chop to the neck, three from heart attacks, and two from natural causes. An actuary engaged by the London Sunday Times concluded that on November 22, 1963, the odds against these witnesses being dead by February 1967 were 100,000 trillion to one. Anthony White. It's the main incident that convinced me that my father was involved in the Kennedy assassination was in 1985. It was 1982 when I had found a diary at my grandparents' house on West Houston Street. This trunk stayed in there under key and lock and took these other trunks that were on top of it off and reached down there and grabbed it and had pulled it outside. And had had my wife had was back there and she had noticed it too. And then, and then when I dusted it off, I knew for a fact it was my father's foot on Because it had Roscoe A. White and it had his military number on the bottom of it. And automatically I opened it up and, and, I, and inside this foot locker was my father's original military uh, records, which were probably about this thick. Inside there, too, was a lot of men burial that had involved the Kennedy assassination. It's the very first thing that I noticed, when I, the first thing that I when I opened the trunk, sitting on top was this black book. It, to me, it looked like a Bible. You know, it was that thick, but it had a little lip that locked over it. And I, and I thought maybe that it was a Bible at first, because my father was, I knew that he, he believed in God, never went to church, and I just thought that it was a Bible that he had left behind. And, and I stuck it all in the suitcase and carried it home. And then after I'd gotten home, and I believe after I started looking through it, I realized that this wasn't a Bible. This was a, my father's diary. And he was black with gold trim around it and had a little lip that came over and had a little lock in it. You know, you could push it, and it had a little snap in there and locked it. It was about this high, about this wide, about this thick. And I would say that it had a probably about 400 pages in it. Every, there was, you know, it had lines all the way down. It didn't have dates and it was completely open. Okay, so it was not pre-printed? It wasn't pre-printed. My father would state each day that he would enter each, each thing that would happen that day. And after each one of those days, he would start another day. 
you know, and then another die, and then whatever was in that die. It started in 1957. The last entry would have been two weeks prior to his death in September, 71. But I thought by reading this diary that I would be able to know my father, what type of person he was, how he thought, um, how, what his morals were. And it was until 1985 where I came apart through the diary where my father was involved in the Kennedy assassination. How many pages of the diary were devoted to the... This the assassination. More than any uh, notation in the whole diary. It was completely one whole full page on one side and another full on the other page. So it was two pages of documentation of the Kennedy assassination on November 22, 1963. And the only thing that it ever mentioned on the, the previous page, it was that they had met, my father had met with somebody prior before the next day. You, you wouldn't even, you would never even know in your life how I felt when I, when I read that. I mean, words can even say it. Because you're talking a man that I loved and treasured and respected. What do you feel his motivation was, based on the diary, based on him, for, for the assassination? He was convinced through other people that, that he was a national security threat or a communist ally trying to, you know, invade. United States in his own ways and convinced my father that this man had to be uh, taken out. In the diary, it never stated that he paid, was paid a dime. And the only thing that was ever in the diary that he did have a safety deposit box that had money in it. And I had a receipt which proven to me that there was $100,000 in Woodward State Bank. I believe that that $100,000 was probably not only the Kennedy assassination, but other involvements my father was prior in his life. I really do. There's no way that that man could ever have $100,000 in the bank making $800 a month. And it'd take a lot of years to save $100,000. I just remember that the, the 21st of November, him and three other men had met the day before. Everything was fine. Uh, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. The entry, as the entry started out is that that my position was the man behind the stockade fence. Parentheses, Mandarin. Mandarin? Mandarin. Okay. Pearl. The man that was in the book depository, Slash, was left behind. The man that was in the record building was Saul. Yeah, it stated that Lebanon had got into the boat depository by heating and air conditioning crew that had worked beside the building. So he was dressed as air conditioning right I believe he was. And yeah. Saul had worked for the Dallas cleaning or crew at the time. It was a janitorial service that Dallas had at the time. But is there any identification as to the names? Of no, I don't know the names of them. But what I know about the diary, I can place, you know, Oswald as being the person that he, he admits that uh, never fired any shots that day. And uh, he had met up with an officer on Cliff and had got in his car. And from that point there, they had gone by a room and house where they were expecting to pick this man up to go to Redford Field. And this man was? This man was Lee Harvey Oswald, and the man, the officer, would be J.D. Tipton. From after they had left the room and house, and it, he had mentioned in the diary that, that this officer had talked twice, scared that it would blow, blow a scene. And he was still in a frantic and had ran to the nearest store. Yeah, and who, who ran this, this officer had went in and made a phone call and had came back outside, got in the car, they wind up going to the rendezvous place. The man that they were supposed to pick up was standing there waiting on them. He got in the car. They were rushing off the Redbird Field. Well, the street that they were on, uh, Oswald had jumped out of the car two blocks before my father shoots Officer at 10th of Highland. And he doesn't stay. He gets out of the car. After Oswald gets out of the car, he states that he just shot an officer at 10 to 9. Did he say when Oswald got out of the car? Two blocks before he shot Officer Tiffany at 10 to 5. My mother had worked for Jack Ruby for three weeks in September of 1963. 
And through her relationship of working there at the Carousel Club, she had overheard Jack Ruby and my father through a crack in the door that uh, they were conspires, conspiring back in September the plot of killing John F. Kennedy. In the summer of 1990, right here at the JFK Assassination Information Center, Ricky White released this story about his father, Roscoe White. We at the JFK Assassination Information Center believe that a formal investigation should be started as soon as possible to determine the validity of these charges. However, no one in power, be it on a state level, local level, or federal level, has ever investigated these charges. We feel that the American people and Ricky White have a right to know the truth about the possible involvement of his father in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy.